Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. Hi, my name is Rick Bully. We're so glad you decided to join us today. I'm the pastor at Westview, and today we're going to be talking about Psalm 84 and what it means to be blessed in this particular situation. You know, but before we get started, I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to uh, contribute to the ministry at Westview. If you would like to do so, you may go online to wbcshelby.org and you can give through our online giving or you can do it through our Westview Baptist Church Venmo account. We're so glad that, uh, that you have decided to join us and we certainly appreciate your gifts and your offerings. So today, um, as we jump into this, I'm going to read this psalm. I think it's just great to hear, first of all. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word today. And Lord, um, we pray today, may we not only have understanding, of what it means to be in your presence, what it means to be wor to worship you and to be blessed, and what blessing means. But Lord, that, that it just takes that relationship that we have with you or the one that we don't, that we are yearning for and have not known exactly what that is. Lord, that that all becomes fused together as one. In Jesus' name, amen. So today as we, we talk about this, that word blessed, are blessed often is thought of we think about a lot of times uh if i have a you know our, about our stuff our belongings our things say that we've accumulated said man i have been blessed and, and it's okay to say that but uh, or is it about our accomplishments um uh, you know our talents our gifts but the true meaning is, is much much more in the hebrew word the word barak it means blessed. Um, there's different things that it could be about. It could mean about being holy or consecrated. Um, it literally means to kneel before God. And we see the word blessed in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Even though we're going to be in the Old New Testament, uh, marakola is the Greek word for it. And it's this this idea of being jo joyful and content in the Lord. And you know, in Psalm 84, we're going to see some things that. Uh, really get down to the root of it, this idea of perpetual praise, what that means, that, that, the, how that is a blessing, and, and blessing through finding Lord in the struggles of life and just watching him transform us. And, and a good way to look at that now, if, you're a, if you've been a follower of Christ, and whether it's been you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50, whatever it may be, are you here's a good way to look at this 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 idea of watching him transform us and it kind of maybe lets us know to ponder where our relationship where are we have we gone in those depths um, are you in a different place than you were say 10 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago blessing is trusting him so let's jump right in and we're going to look at this these first couple of verses and you know i believe that when we see this this first part we're going to look, I believe that our first point is this was our original design. He says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns. It even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my, crash, uh, my flesh cry out for the living God. You know, in the creation story in Genesis, we see this beautiful picture, how God created the heavens and the earth and and uh, all the, uh, the animals and the fish of the sea and uh, the plants, just the whole creation story. And in the end, uh, we see that in, in chapter 2, there's a, an account of the creation story, even up to the point of his crown creation, which was, was humanity. 
He says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord made the earth and the heavens. This is starting with verse 5 of chapter 2. And he says, now, no shrub had appeared on the earth, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord, he says, he formed man from dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You are God-breathed in that way. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he must he put the man he had formed. The Lord made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was a river that watered, watering the garden. Everything with provision was made, it says, flowing from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. Um, the first was the Pishon, it, its winds through the entire land of the Havilah, where there's gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic, resin, and onyx are also there. This this beautiful description of, of the Garden of Eden. The name of the second river is the Gihon. Uh, its winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris. It runs along the east of Ashur. And the fourth was the Euphrates. Now listen to this. The Lord God put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. We see that from the very beginning. Before sin ever entered in the garden, the design was for mankind to work that garden and take care of it. It didn't say it, the difficulty was going to be as we see after the, the fall. But anyway, he says, And the Lord God commanded man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so, you know, God was, he was putting a, a prohibition in there. He gave man the choice. He, he, I mean, he told him not to. And we can choose to obey or not to obey, but he, he says you're going to die if you disobey. Now, that was spiritual death. The Lord God said it's not good for man to be alone. And so at this point, he says, I will make a help, helper suitable for him. And so he formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused man to fall in a deep sleep. He took one of the man's ribs and he closed him up. And then the Lord God made woman into the rib. He'd taken it out of the man and he brought her to the man. And he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Man, what a beautiful, harmonious love relationship we see that God has with his creation as the creator, and we are his creation. Our true home was there with God from the very beginning. And this lovely dwelling place that we're talking about in Psalm 84 we had that. That was our true home to begin with. And, and yet, we see that we were destined to be there to, to worship with him, or to worship him, our creator, just like the creation does. And yet, now something is different. We know the fall took place, and, and mankind was made to, to be put out because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, exactly the thing that God knew that we should not do, we did. And so we're desired to, to um, excuse me, we're designed to desire his presence. Psalm 42 says it so well. Uh, he says it this way, as a deer pants for the streams of water, my soul pants for you, my God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And so just like, you know, you've seen that, we have deer all in our neighborhood, you've seen them. They're always gonna be around a source of water. It's just like they've got, they they got to have it. It's, it is sustenance. That's the way our soul is. Our hearts cry out. We're, and uh, he even says, he says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. It's there. And you have to know, you know, we're always trying to, to fill our hearts with something. Sometimes it's not of God, but that's what we're really... And that's why we notice in the scripture, I believe it's Jeremiah or Ezekiel 1, where he says that the, the heart is desperately wicked. But we know that through the Spirit and through Jesus, as we uh, give ourselves to him, that new nature comes in. And, and we still have the old flesh there. And so our heart's going to cry out. 
But we get twisted with sometimes, what are we crying out for? Is it? And we start filling it with other things. We're trying to get satisfied with other things. People are always trying to tell us what our hearts desire, what, what's going to satisfy. I think of an old song, it's, it's a secular song by the Rolling Stones that says, I can't get no satisfaction. And you think about that, I pull those lyrics up. And just listen to this. It says, I can't get no satisfaction. And I try and I try and I try and I can't get no. I can't get no. And he goes on. He says, when I'm driving my car and the man comes on the radio, he's telling me more and more about useless information. Supposed to fire my imagination. I can't get no. I can't get no. Hey, hey, that's what I say. I can't get no satisfaction. And I try and I try and I try and I still can't get no. He says, even when I'm watching TV and a man comes on and tells me how white shirts, how white my shirts can be, he says, but he can't be a man because he doesn't smoke the same cigarettes as me. I can't get, oh, no, no, the, the satisfaction that, that we are so desperately seeking, that our hearts are crying out for, is only in one thing. It's not in the stuff or how we look or... Uh, Whatever it may be, it's in the living God. And so go to him. Go to this dwelling. We're going to look at this. Now, the temple was the place of God. That's the beautiful thing that we see in the scriptures. And in the Old Testament, and at first it was the tabernacle, as we see, uh, you know, going through. And, and then they, uh, of course, Solomon built the temple. And here we are with Psalm. We're seeing this, this idea. And... And so look what he says in verse, the second thing I want you to see is we're born to live in our true home. He says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. There they are ever praising you. Born, we were born to live in our true home and that's with God. And even though his dwelling place, we were, um, banned from the Garden of Eden. And now we see that the dwelling place of God was in the temple. But we forever are to have God in our heart. We're going to see that. We're born to live in our true home. Even creation recognizes the Creator. Even despair has found a home, he says there. This, these birds are, you know, it's kind of, it reminds me of, of this idea of, see, these nests of the birds were located, they could be located in the crevices in the walls of the, uh, in the, uh, of the buildings there at the altar or, or in the trees of the temple courts. And, and we see that these birds, they have some symbolism here. They are, they are the uh, uh, life and freedom and, and joy for those who are close to God. Here they are. And just as he's saying, they, they found their home. They found their home. They're, they're like um, this, uh, I guess you could say this, this holy place that we see the temple of God we're seeing in the Old Testament is the epitome you know, of uh, the undisturbed, fulfilled life that we have in God and God alone. And these birds, I mean, you know, they're used even in the New Testament. Jesus talked about, you know, he said in Luke, uh, I believe it was Luke uh, 958. That's what it was. And he says, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And then we see over in Matthew, he starts talking about this very, and he's like, don't worry about anything. I mean, he says, I've provided even nests, you know, for the birds and food and everything. And you don't need to worry about a thing. He says, all of those of you who are my children, I've even provided for the sparrow. And here they are. They're in this temple, and we see this. The birds are like the temple singers that are never ending there. And... And so it's like, as we see this, he says, a place near your altar, the Lord Almighty, my King and my God, happy are those, blessed are those who are born to live in their true home. Blessed are those who have the privilege of continually dwelling in the temple. And now, now it's interesting. In the temple, the priest and the Le Levites, the priests, they carried out the pri priestly duties. The Levites were kind of like deacons and they were serving. And, you know, we know that. But yet they were even preparing for those that were on journey to the temple. And so the joy was for all, not just for them. And they had that privilege. But we're going to see that God has provided so much more. You know, it's so much. We can think about this as, as we are born to live in our true home. 
it begins to, to radically shift the way we think about things. As we spend that pres our time in the presence of God, it reminded me of an article I saw the other day uh, about the founder of Hobby Lobby, uh, uh, the CEO, his name's David Green. And he, he talks about in this article how he, he was obviously, he's a believer. There, it's a Christian organization. And he remembers that when he be began, he said, I started doing so well. And he said, man, I just thought I had the Midas touch. This was back in the 80s. And he said, until I nearly lost the business. He says, God had to show me that he was the one who granted success. In fact, he pulls a scripture from De Deuteronomy 8, 18 that states that it's God who gives us the power to make wealth. It's not us. It's this, whatever that may be. However, and, and so here he was in this place. And he says, you know, from the very beginning, I began, I knew when we started that the purpose was to honor God in all that we did. He says, we worked hard and we gave uh, God the results. Uh, and God, you know, we gave him that. And, and as we looked at this, he says, we were blessed by God. He used that word. We saw it a great privilege to give back through this. And so we've been able now to provide hope through supporting ministries and planting churches all over the world <laughs> as a part of this. Now, the bigger mission, he says, and the purpose helped him realize that, that basically, he, he says, I was just a steward, a manager of what God had entrusted me. God was the true owner of my business. For me, my source of truth has always been prayer and the Bible. Prayer, that, that spending time with the living God, knowing that his heart was yearning. I believe that's what he's done in, in getting the... The, the living word into him. In fact, there was an idea that he says that churches, I mean, in, in uh, Europe, that a lot of times people, when they start a business, they try to make it set up to last at least a couple of years. And he said, it made me, th made me think more and more about that. That idea is something he says we don't do in America. But he says, I really, what I wanted to do was create a business that would continue to honor God to reward employees with meaningful work and compensation and be great contributors to hope and healing around the world. Now, it's interesting. He has, David Green, out of being blessed by God, has felt that, he says, my decision, he has given away the ownership of the building. He didn't give it to his kids. He's just giving it away. He says, I'm giving away the ownership of Hobby Lobby. And he said, it came down to God, I've just been a steward of this. And he says, you can do this for yourself or you can choose me and trust me. And he says, I chose God. Folks, we all have a divine, a divine assignment. But it must be centered around living in our true home, recognizing the creator, being in that place of perpetual praise, of, of seeking the Lord and being with him, just like we see that, the psalmist talking about our hearts and crying out and, and uh, this blessing of dwelling in that place of God and meeting him. Let's look at the last point I want you to see, and that is blessed, blessed are those who put their faith in God. Look at 5, 6, and 7. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. You see, beyond the priest and the Levites, they were already there, but they still, they at some point in their pilgrimage had given themselves to God. But all of us, all those pilgrims who put their faith in God, it's like strength to strength. Uh, he said, he goes on, he says, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. And so we see this, this time that faith strengthens us you know, as we put our faith in God, as, as we look beyond what's in the present circumstances. You know, uh, I know someone recently that uh, had had to have a procedure done, and they were there in the hospital. And they were talking about, uh, they had seen uh, the physician the other day, they had thought in their vehicle, and they said they lived close to one another, and they were talking about that. And said, well, do you drive a such and such car? And they said, yeah. I said, well, I saw you the other day. He said, you know, I'm the one who picks up trash 
And they're like, you're the trash lady. <laughs> and he's like, yes. And he said, well, how'd you get into that? She said, you know, it's a natural thing. He said, every day when I walk out and I go for my walk, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, 3. And they began their day that way. And they said, as they do that, so they were looking down and they were looking at all this trash on the ground. And they're like, well, I'm not, the glory of God is getting disturbed. And he's like, why can't I do something about it? So they, every morning as they walk, they pick up trash. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Mighty. And his whole creation is full of his glory. They're giving praise to God, even in the midst of that. And they were getting ready to have this surgery. And there was the, the nurses and the physician, and they were all hearing this testimony of this person talking about their faith in God, even as they were getting ready to go in to have something done, you know, and they're giving God the glory. And so we all, these people were on this, this journey, this journey to the temple, and they're talking about this Valley of Baca. They make, it's a, a place where they think it's the end of the summer when this was written, and it's dry, and it's, it's just before now it's talking about a place of spring. They make it a place of springs, the autumn rains covered with pools. And even in the midst of that, their focus, their pilgrimage is on getting to the temple because they know the presence of the Lord there, but something unique has taken place. Now, because Jesus has come, he is the temple. And as we invite him into our lives, we have the beauty of the temple of God living within us. I love how um, Peter said it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, that means a temple, to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we see this beautiful picture that now, yes, we come to our, our places of worship, our churches, our sanctuaries to worship, to corporate worship together. But now, since Jesus has come and the Holy Spirit has come, we have the presence of God within us. And we can, God is, we know he's omnipresent. He is everywhere. He always has been. But we now can recognize that presence. It's not just his immediate presence in the temple of God. Because we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We are those spiritual houses that are built now with Jesus living in us, the, the temple. And so that is a blessing when we, we realize wherever pilgrims go, that we are looking to God's presence. Because we are at home with God. It makes up for all of the challenging times. Whether we're in them, whether we're going to be in them, whether we have already been in them. I love what, I'll close with this, what uh, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21. He said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The ultimate victory will be in the presence of the immediate presence of God when we come face to face with Jesus, when our spirit does, when we leave, leave these bodies to go to be with him, or he returns with, to us first. And so with that in, thought, in mind, know that you are blessed. You are blessed by a living God who lives within us in this, this temple, this spiritual temple through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And I pray as we have been here today, Lord, in your word, that we now just step back and take a deep breath. And Lord, we breathe in the goodness of you, Lord. And even though that, Father, our, our spiritual fathers, Adam and Eve, our spiritual parents, Lord, they were banned from the garden. You didn't abandon us. Lord, you knew those yearnings, those longings, and then hearts would cry out for you. You made us that way. And you really are our true home. So now you've given us your son, Jesus. And I pray that you, as a person who has been created by God, who are listening to this, that God has created your true home to be with him. 
and that you may have that now as you come to Jesus. I pray that we will come to him as he is calling you. Is he calling you to come to his home, to, to live with him and to him to live with you inside of you and make you that temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit even. Lord, as a greater part of that as the church, that you may come and be a part of the people of God. Say yes to his invitation and come to him and begin to enjoy the fruit of that yearning, that longing, your heart crying out, being fully satisfied by the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that as you, if you receive Jesus today and you made your true home with him, I would love to hear from you. You can contact me. Again, my name is Rick Bowling at wbcshelby.org. Or contact a local pastor in your area or a trusted friend that's a believer. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.